We hope you enjoy this presentation of the 3324 Podcasts Holiday Treasury Volume 5, featuring Sean Grady, Nick Leshy, Christy Cuomo, and Dean Legiro. Christmas on Wheels A railroad station in a large city is hardly an inviting spot, at its best. But at the close of a cold, cheerless, blustering December day, when biting drafts of wind come scurrying in at every open door, filling the air with a gray compound of dust and fine snow, when passengers tramp up and down the long platform, waiting impatiently for their trains, when newsboys wander about with disconsolate red faces, hands in pockets, and bundles of unsold papers under their ragged and shivering arms, when, in general, humankind presents itself as altogether a frozen, forlorn, discouraged, and hopeless race, condemned to be swept about on the nipping, dusty wind, like Francesca and her lover, at the rate of thirty miles an hour, then the station becomes positively unendurable. So thought Bob Estabrook as he paced to and fro in the Boston and Albany depot, traveling bag in hand, on just such a night as I have described. Beside him, locomotives puffed and plunged and backed on the shining rails as if they, too, felt compelled to trot up and down to keep themselves warm and in even tolerably good humor. Just my luck, growled Bob with a misanthropic glare at a loud-voiced family who were passing. Christmas is coming, two jolly Brighton parties, and an oratorio thrown up, and here am I, fired off to San Francisco. So much for being junior member of a law firm. Wonder what... Here the ruffled current of his meditations ran plump against a rock, and as suddenly diverged from their former course. The rock was no less than a young person, who at that moment approached, with a gray-haired man, and inquired the way to the ticket office. Bob politely gave them the desired information, and watched them with a growing interest as they followed his directions, and stood before the lighted window. The two silhouettes were decidedly out of the common. The voice, whose delicate tone still lingered pleasantly about Mr. Robert Estabrook's fastidious ears, was an individual voice, as distinguishable from any other he remembered as was the owner's bright face, the little fur collar beneath it, daintily gloved hands, and the pretty brown traveling suit. Dignified, old fellow, mused Bob, irrelevantly as the couple moved toward the train gates. Probably her father, perhaps. Hello. By George, they're going on my car. With which breath of summer in his winter of discontent, the young man proceeded to finish his cigar, consult his watch, and, as the last warning bell rang, step upon the platform of the already moving Pullman. It must be admitted that as he entered he gave an expectant glance down the aisle of the car, but the somber curtains hanging from the ceiling to floor told no tales. Too sleepy to speculate, he found his berth, arranged himself for the night with the nonchalance of an old traveler, and, laying his head upon his vibrating atom of a pillow, was soon plunged into a dream at least fifty miles long. It was snowing, and snowing hard. Moreover, it had been snowing all night and all the afternoon before. The wind rioted furiously over the broad Missouri plains, alternately building up huge castles of snow and throwing them down again like a fretful child, always the same tireless, pitiless, awful power. A mere hyphen upon the broad, white page lay the western-bound train. The fires and the locomotives, there were two of them, had been suffered to go out, and the great creatures waited silently together, left alone in the storm, while the snow drifted higher and higher upon their patient backs. When Bob had waked that morning to find the tempest more furious than ever, and the train stuck fast in a huge snowbank, his first thought was of dismay at the possible detention in the narrow limits of the Pullman, which seemed much colder than it had before. His next was to wonder how the change of fortune would affect Gertrude Raymond. Of course, he had long ago become acquainted with the brown traveling suit and fur collar. 
Of course, there had been numberless little services for him to perform for her and the old gentleman, who had indeed proved to be her father. Bob had already begun to dread the end of the journey. He had gone to his berth the night before, wishing that San Francisco were ten days from Boston instead of six. Once more he became misanthropic. There's Miss Raymond now, he growled to himself, knocking his head savagely against the upper berth in his attempt to look out through the frosty pane. Sitting over across the aisle day after day with her kid gloves and all that. Nice enough, of course. Recalling one or two spirited conversations where hours had slipped by like minutes, but confoundedly useless like the rest of them. If she were like Mother now, there'd be no trouble. She'd take care of herself, but as it is, the whole car would be turned upside down for her today, for fear she'll freeze, or starve, or spoil her complexion or something. Here, Bob turned an extremely cold shoulder on the window, and having performed a sort of horizontal toilet, emerged from his berth, his hair on end, and his face expressive of utter defiance to the world in general, and contempt of fashionable young ladies in particular. At that moment, Miss Raymond appeared in the aisle, sweet and rosy as a June morning, her cheeks glowing and her eyes sparkling with fun. Good morning, Mr. Estabrook, she said demurely, settling the fur collar about her neck. Bob endeavored to look dignified and was conscious of failure. Good mo morning, he replied with some stiffness and a shiver which took him by surprise. It was cold, jumping out of that warm berth. I understand we must stay, but don't let me detain you, she added with a sly glance at his hair. Bob turned and marched off solemnly to the masculine end of the car, washed in ice water, completed his toilet, and came back refreshed. Breakfast was formally served as usual, and then a council of war was held, conductor, engineers, and brakemen being consulted and inventories taken. It was found that while food was abundant, the stock of wood in the bins would not last till noon. There were twelve railroad men and thirty-five passengers on board, some twenty of the latter being immigrants in a second class behind the two Pullmans. The little company gathered in the snowbound car looked blankly at each other, some of them instinctively drawing their wraps more tightly about their shoulders, as if they already felt the approaching chill. It was miles to the nearest station in either direction. Above, below, on all sides, was the white blur of tumultuous wind-lashed snow. The silence was broken pleasantly. Once more, Bob felt the power of those clear, sweet tones. The men must make up a party to hunt for wood, she said. While you're gone, we women will do what we can for those who are left. The necessity for immediate action was evident, and without further words, the council broke up to obey her suggestion. A dozen men, looking like amateur Eskimo and floundering up to their armpits at the first step, started off through the drifts. One of the trainmen, who knew the line of the road thoroughly, was sure they must be near a certain clump of trees where plenty of wood could be obtained. Taking the precaution to move in single line, one of the engineers, a broad-shouldered six-footer leading the way and steering by compass, they were soon out of sight. As they struck off at right angles to the track, Bob thought he recognized a face pressed close to the pane and watching them anxiously, but he could not be sure. Two hours later, the men appeared once more, some staggering under huge logs, some with axes, some with bundles of lighter boughs for kindling. In another five minutes, smoke was going up cheerily from the whole line of cars, for the trees had proved to be less than a quarter of a mile distant, and the supply would be plentiful before night. When Bob Estabrook stamped into his own car, hugging up a big armful of wood, he was a different-looking fellow from the trim young lawyer who was wont to stand before the jury seats in the Boston courthouse. He had on a pair of immense blue yarn mittens loaned by a kindly brakeman. His face was scratched with refractory twigs. His eyebrows were frosted, his mustache an icy carré, two fingertips frozen, and with all this he looked and felt more manly than ever before in his life. His eye roved through the length of the car as it had that first night in the depot. She was not there. He was as anxious as a boy for her praise. Guess I'll take it to the next car, 
he said apologetically to the nearest passenger. There's more coming just behind. She was not in the second Pullman. Of course she wasn't in the baggage car. Was it possible? He had entered the third and last car, recoiling just a bit at the odor of a crowded and unclean poverty which met him at the door. Sure enough, there she sat, his idol, fashionable type of inutility, with one frowsy child upon the seat beside her, two very rumpled-looking boys in front, and in her arms a baby with terracotta hair. She seemed to be singing it to sleep, and kept on with her soft crooning as she glanced up over his tangled red locks at Snowy Bob and his armful of wood, with a look in her eyes that would have sent him cheerfully to Alaska for more, had there been need. With the comfortable heat of the fires, the kind offices of nearly all the well-dressed people to the poorer ones, for they were not slow to follow Miss Raymond's example, the day wore on quietly and not unpleasantly toward its close. Then someone suddenly remembered that it was Christmas Eve. Dear me, cried Miss Raymond, delightedly reaching round the baby to clap her hands. Let's have a Christmas party. Preparations commenced without delay. All the young people put their heads together in one corner, and many were the explosions of laughter as the program grew. Trunks were visited by their owners and small articles abstracted therefrom to serve as gifts for the immigrants and trainmen, to whose particular entertainment the evening was by common consent to be devoted. Just as the lamps were lighted in the train, our hero, who had disappeared early in the afternoon, returned, dragging after him a small, stunted pine tree, which seemed to have strayed away from its native forests on purpose for the celebration. On being admitted to the Grand Hall, Bob further added to the decorations a few strings of a queer, mossy sort of evergreen. Hereupon, a very young man with light eyebrows, who had hitherto been inconspicuous, suddenly appeared from the depths of a battered trunk, over the edge of which he had for some time been bent like a siphon, and with a beaming face produced a box of veritable tiny wax candles. He was on the road, he explained, for a large wholesale toy shop, and these were samples. He guessed he could make it all right with the firm. Of course the affair was a great success. I have no space to tell of the sheltered walk that Bob constructed of rugs, from car to car, of the beautified interior of the old baggage car, draped with shawls and brightened with bits of ribbon, of the mute wonder of the poor immigrants a number of whom had just arrived from Germany and could not speak a word of English, of their unbounded delight when the glistening tree was disclosed and the cries of Weihnachtsbaum, Weihnachtsbaum from their rumpled children whose faces waked into a glow of blissful recollection at the sight. Ah, if you could have seen the pretty gifts, the brave little pine, which all the managers agreed couldn't possibly have been used had it been an inch taller. The improvised tableau, wherein Bob successively personated an organ grinder, a pug dog, and Hamlet, amid thunders of applause from the brakemen and engineers. Then the passengers sang a simple Christmas carol, Miss Raymond leading with her pure soprano, and Bob chiming in like the diapason of an organ. Just as the last words died away, a sudden hush came over the audience. Could it be an illusion? Or did they hear the muffled but sweet notes of a church bell faintly sounding without? Tears came into the eyes of some of the roughest of the immigrants as they listened and thought of a wee belfry somewhere in the fatherland where the Christmas bells were calling to prayers that night. The sound of the bells ceased and the merriment went on while the young man with eyebrows lighter than ever but with radiant face let himself quietly into the car unnoticed. It had been his own thought to creep out into the storm, clear away the snow from the nearest locomotive bell, and ring it while the gaiety was at its height. All this indeed there was, and more, but to Bob, the joy and sweetness of the evening centered in one bright face. What mattered it if the wind roared and moaned about the lonely snow-drifted train, while he could look into those brown eyes and listen to that voice for whose every tone he was fast learning to watch? Truly, 
it was a wonderful evening altogether. Well, the blockade was raised, and the long railroad trip finished at last. But two of its passengers, at least, have agreed to enter upon still a longer journey. She says it all began when he came staggering in with his armful of wood and his blue mittens. And he, he doesn't care at all when it began. He only realizes the joy that has come to him and believes that after a certain day next May, it will be Christmas for him all the year round. Christmas Gifts by Laura E. Richards Mother, said Jack, may I have some money to buy Christmas presents with? Dear, said his mother, I have no money. We are very poor and I can hardly buy enough food for us all. Jack hung his head. If he had not been ten, the tears would have come to his eyes. But he was ten. All the other boys give presents, he said. So shall you, said his mother. All presents are not bought with money. The best boy that ever lived was as poor as we are, and yet he was always giving. Who was he, asked Jack, and what did he give? This is his birthday, said the mother. He was the good Jesus. He was born in a stable, and he lived in a poor working man's house. He never had a penny of his own, and yet he gave twelve good gifts every day. Would you like to try his way? Yes, cried Jack. So his mother told him this and that, and soon after Jack started out, dressed in his best suit, to give his presents. First, he went to Aunt Jane's house. She was old and lame, and she did not like boys. What do you want? she asked. Merry Christmas, said Jack. May I stay for an hour and help you? Humph, <laughs> said Aunt Jane. Want to keep you out of mischief, do they? Well, you may bring in some wood. Shall I split some kindling, too? asked Jack. If you know how, said Aunt Jane, I can't have you cutting your foot and messing my clean shed all up. Jack found some fresh pine wood and a bright hatchet, and he split up a great pile of kindling and thought it fun. He stacked it neatly and then brought in a pail of fresh water and filled the kettle. What else can I do, he asked. There are twenty minutes more. Humph, <laughs> said Aunt Jane. You might feed the pig. Jack fed the pig, who thanked them in his own way. Ten minutes more, he said. What shall I do now? Humph, <laughs> said Aunt Jane. You may sit down and tell me why you came. It is a Christmas present, said Jack. I am giving hours for presents. I had twelve, but I gave one to mother, and another one was gone before I knew I had it. This hour was your present. Humph said Aunt Jane. She hobbled to the cupboard and took out a small round pie that smelt very good. Here, she said, this is your present, and I thank you for mine. Come again, will you? Indeed I will, said Jack, and thank you for the pie. Next, Jack went and read for an hour to old Mr. Green, who was blind. He read a book about the sea, and they both liked it very much, so the hour went quickly. Then it was time to help Mother get dinner, and then time to eat it. That took two hours, and Aunt Jane's pie was wonderful. Then Jack took the Smith baby for a ride in its carriage, as Mr. Smith was ill, and they met its grandfather, who filled Jack's pockets with candy and popcorn, and invited him to a Christmas tree that night. Next, Jack went to see Willie Brown, who had been ill for a long time and could not leave his bed. Willie was very glad to see him. They played a game, and then each told the other a story, and before Jack knew it, the clock struck six. Oh, cried Jack, you have had two. Two what? asked Willie. Two hours, said Jack, and he told Willie about the presents he was giving. I am glad I gave you two, he said, and I would give you three, but I must go and help mother. Oh, dear, said Willie. I thank you very much, Jack. I have had a perfectly great time, but I have nothing to give you. <laughs> Jack laughed. Why, don't you see, he cried. You have given me just the same thing. I have had a great time, too. Mother, said Jack as he was going to bed, I have had a splendid Christmas. 
but I wish I had something to give you besides the hours. My darling, said his mother, you have given me the best gift of all, yourself. A Christmas Mistake Tomorrow is Christmas, announced Teddy Grant exultantly as he sat on the floor struggling manfully with a refractory bootlace that was knotted and tagless and stubbornly refused to go into the eyelets of Teddy's patched boots. Ain't I glad, though. Hurrah! His mother was washing the breakfast dishes in a dreary, listless sort of way. She looked tired and broken-spirited. Ted's enthusiasm seemed to grate on her, for she answered sharply, Christmas indeed. I can't see that it is anything for us to rejoice over. Other people may be glad enough, but what with winter coming on, I'd sooner it was spring than Christmas. Mary Alice, do lift that child out of the ashes and put its shoes on and stockings on. Everything seems to be at the sixes and sevens here this morning. Keith, the oldest boy, was coiled up on the sofa calmly working out some algebra problems, quite oblivious to the noise around him. But he looked up from his slate with his pencil suspended above an obstinate equation to declaim with a flourish, Christmas comes but once a year, and then mother wishes it wasn't here. I don't then, said Gordon, son number two, who was preparing his own noon lunch of bread and molasses at the table and making an atrocious mess of crumbs and sugary syrup over everything. I know one thing to be thankful for, and that is there'll be no school. We'll have a whole week of holidays. Gordon was noted for his aversion to school and his affection for holidays. And we're going to have turkey for dinner, declared Teddy, getting up off the floor and rushing to secure his share of bread and molasses. And cranberry sauce and, and pound cake, ain't we, Ma? No, you are not, said Mrs. Grant desperately dropping the dishcloth and snatching the baby on her knee to wipe the crust of cinders and molasses from the chubby pink and white face. You may as well know it now, children. I've kept it from you so far in hopes that something would turn up, but nothing has. We can't have any Christmas dinner tomorrow. We can't afford it. I've pinched and saved every way I could for the last month, hoping that I'd be able to get a turkey for you anyhow but you'll have to do without it. There's that doctor's bill to pay and, and a dozen other bills coming in, and people say they can't wait. I suppose they can't, but it's kind of hard, I must say. The little Grants stood with open mouths and horrified eyes. No turkey for Christmas? Was the world coming to an end? Wouldn't the government interfere if anyone ventured to dispense with a Christmas celebration? The gluttonous Teddy stuffed his fists into his eyes and lifted up his voice. Keith, who understood better than the others the look on his mother's face, took his blubbering younger brother by the collar and marched him into the porch. The twins, seeing this summary proceeding, swallowed the outcries they had intended to make, although they couldn't keep a few big tears from running down their fat cheeks. Mrs. Grant looked pityingly at the disappointed faces about her. Don't cry, children. You make me feel worse. We are not the only ones who will have to do without a Christmas turkey. We ought to be very thankful that we have anything to eat at all. I hate to disappoint you, but it can't be helped. Never mind, Mother, said Keith comfortingly, relaxing his hold upon the porch door, whereupon it suddenly flew open and precipitated Teddy, who had been tugging at the handle, heels overhead backwards. We know you've done your best. It's been a hard year for you. Just wait, though. I'll soon be grown up, and then you and these greedy youngsters shall feast on turkey every day of the year. Oh, hello, Teddy. Have you got on your feet again? Mind, sir. No more blubbering. When I'm a man, announced Teddy with dignity, I'd just like to see you put me in the porch. And I mean to have turkey all the time, and I won't give you any either. All right, you greedy small boy. Only take yourself off to school now, and let us hear no more squeaks out of you. Tramp, all of you, and give Mother a chance to get her work done. Mrs. Grant got up and fell to work at her dishes with a brighter face. 
Well, we mustn't give in. Perhaps things will be better after a while. I'll make a famous bread pudding, and you can boil some molasses taffy and ask those little Smithsons next door to help you pull it. They won't whine for turkey, I'll be bound. I don't suppose they ever tasted such a thing in all their lives. If I could afford it, I'd have had them all into dinner with us. That sermon Mr. Evans preached last Sunday kind of stirred me up. He said we ought always to try and share our Christmas joy with some poor souls who had never learned the meaning of the word. I can't do as much as I'd like to. It was different when your father was alive. The noisy group grew silent as they always did when their father was spoken of. He had died the year before, and since his death the little family had had a hard time. Keith, to hide his feelings, began to hector the rest. Mary Alice, do hurry up. Here, you twin nuisances, get off to school. If you don't, you'll be late, and then the master will give you a whipping. He won't, answered irrepressible Teddy. He never whips us. He doesn't. He stands us on the floor sometimes, though, he added, remembering the many times his own chubby legs had been seen to better advantage on the school platform. That man, said Mrs. Grant, alluding to the teacher, makes me nervous. He is the most abstracted creature I ever saw in my life. It is a wonder to me he doesn't walk straight into the river some day. You'll meet him meandering along the street, gazing into vacancy, and I'll never see you nor hear a word you say half the time. Yesterday, said Gordon, chuckling over the remembrance, he came in with a big piece of paper he'd picked up on the entry floor in one hand and his hat in the other and he stuffed his hat into the coal scuttle and hung up the paper on a nail as grave as you please. Never knew the difference till Ned Slocum went and told him. He's always doing things like that. Keith had collected his books and now marched his brothers and sisters off to school. Left alone with the baby, Mrs. Grant betook herself to work with a heavy heart. But a second interruption broke the progress of her dishwashing. I declare she said with a surprised glance through the window. If there isn't that absent-minded schoolteacher coming through the yard, what can he want? Dear me, I do hope Teddy hasn't been cutting capers in school again. For the teacher's last call had been in October, and he had been occasioned by the fact that the irrepressible Teddy would persist in going to school with his pockets filled with live crickets and in driving them harnessed to strings up and down the aisle when his teacher's back was turned. All mild methods of punishment having failed, the teacher had called to talk it over with Mrs. Grant, with the happy result that Teddy's behavior had improved, in the matter of crickets at least. But it was about time for another outbreak. Teddy had been unnaturally good for too long a time. Poor Mrs. Grant feared that it was the calm before a storm and it was with nervous haste that she went to the door and greeted the young teacher. He was a slight, pale, boyish-looking fellow with an abstracted, musing look in his large, dark eyes. Mrs. Grant noticed with amusement that he wore a white straw hat in spite of the season. His eyes were directed to her face with his usual unseeing gaze, just as though he was looking through me at something a thousand miles away, said Mrs. Grant afterwards. I believe he was, too. His body was right there, on the steps before me. Where his soul was is more than you or I or anybody can tell. Good morning, he said absently. I have just called on my way to school with a message from Miss Millar. She wants you all to come up and have Christmas dinner with her tomorrow. For the land's sake, said Mrs. Grant blankly. I don't understand. To herself, she thought... I wish I dared to take him and shake him to find if he's walking in his sleep or not. You and all the children, every one, went on the teacher dreamily, as if he were reciting a lesson learned beforehand. She told me to tell you to be sure and come. Shall I say that you will? Oh, yes, that is, I I suppose, I, I don't know, said Mrs. Grant incoherently. I never expected... Yes. Yes, you may tell her we'll come, she concluded abruptly. Thank you, said the abstracted messenger, 
gravely lifting his hat and looking squarely through Mrs. Grant into unknown regions. When he had gone, Mrs. Grant went in and sat down, laughing in a sort of hysterical way. I wonder if it is all right. Could Cornelia really have told him? She must, I suppose, but it is enough to take one's breath. Mrs. Grant and Cornelia Millar were cousins and had once been the closest of friends, but that was years ago, before some spiteful reports and ill-natured gossip had come between them, making only a little rift at first that soon widened into a chasm of coldness and alienation. Therefore, this invitation surprised Mrs. Grant greatly. Miss Cornelia was a maiden lady of certain years, with a comfortable bank account and a handsome old-fashioned house on the hill behind the village. She always boarded the school teachers and looked after them maternally. She was an active church worker and a tower of strength to struggling ministers and their families. If Cornelia has seen fit at last to hold out the hand of reconciliation, I'm glad enough to take it. Dear knows, I've wanted to make up often enough, but I didn't think she ever would. We've both of us got too much pride and stubbornness. It's the turn of blood in us that does it. The turners were also set. But I mean to do my part now that she has done hers. And Mrs. Grant made a final attack on the dishes with a beaming face. When the little Grants came home and heard the news, Teddy stood on his head to express his delight. The twins kissed each other, and Mary Alice and Gordon danced around the kitchen. Keith thought himself too big to betray any joy over a Christmas dinner, but he whistled while doing the chores until the bare welkin in the yard rang, and Teddy, in spite of unheard misdemeanors, was not collared off into the porch once. When the young teacher got home from school that evening, he found the yellow house full of all sorts of delectable odors. Miss Cornelia herself was concocting mince pies after the famous family recipe, while her ancient and faithful handmaiden, Hannah, was straining into molds the cranberry jelly. The open pantry door revealed a tempting array of Christmas delicacies. Did you call and invite the Smithsons up to dinner as I told you? asked Miss Cornelia anxiously. Yes, was the dreamy response as he glided through the kitchen and vanished into the hall. Miss Cornelia crimped the edges of her pies delicately with a relieved air. I made certain he'd forget it, she said. You just have to watch him, as if he were a mere child. Didn't I catch him yesterday starting off to school in his carpet slippers? And in spite of me, he got away today in that ridiculous summer hat. You'd better set that jelly in the out pantry to cool, Hannah. It looks good. We'll give those poor little Smithsons a feast for once in their lives if they never get another. At this juncture, the hall door flew open and Mr. Palmer appeared on the threshold. He seemed considerably agitated, and for once his eyes had lost their look of space-searching. Miss Millar, I'm afraid I did make a mistake this morning. It has just dawned on me. I am almost sure that I called at Mrs. Grant's and invited her and her family instead of the Smithsons, and she said they would come. Miss Cornelia's face was a study. Mr. Palmer, she said, flourishing her crimping fork tragically, do you mean to say you went and invited Linda Grant here tomorrow? Linda Grant of all women in this world? I did, said the teacher with penitent wretchedness. It was very careless of me. I am very sorry. What can I do? I'll go down and tell them I made a mistake if you like. You can't do that, groaned Miss Cornelia, sitting down and wrinkling up her forehead in dire perplexity. It would never do in the world. For pity's sake, let me think for a minute. Miss Cornelia did think, to good purpose, evidently, for her forehead smoothed out as her meditations proceeded and her face brightened. Then she got up briskly. Well, you've done it and no mistake. I don't know that I'm sorry either. Anyhow, we'll leave it as it is. But you must go straight down now and invite the Smithsons too. And for pity's sake, don't make any more mistakes. When he had gone, Miss Cornelia opened her heart to Hannah. I never could have done it myself, never. The Turner is too strong in me. But I'm glad it is done. I've been wanting for years to make up with Linda. And now the chance has come 
thanks to that blessed blundering boy. I mean to make the most of it. Mind, Hannah, you never whisper a word about it being a mistake. Linda must never know. Poor Linda. She's had a hard time. Hannah, we must make some more pies, and I must go straight down to the store and get some more Santa Claus stuff. I've only got enough to go around the Smithsons. When Mrs. Grant and her family arrived at the Yellow House next morning, Miss Cornelia herself ran out, bareheaded to meet them. The two women shook hands a little stiffly, and then a rill of long-repressed affection trickled out from some secret spring in Miss Cornelia's heart, and she kissed her newfound old friend tenderly. Linda returned the kiss warmly, and both felt that the old-time friendship was theirs again. The little Smithsons all came, and they and the little Grants sat down on the long, bright dining room to a dinner that made history in their small lives and was eaten over again in happy dreams for months. How those children did eat, and how beaming Miss Cornelia and grim face, soft hearted Hannah, and even the absent minded teacher himself enjoyed watching them. After dinner, Miss Cornelia distributed among the delighted little souls the presents she had bought for them, and then turned them loose in the big, shining kitchen to have a taffy pull, and they had it to their heart's content. And as for the shocking, taffy-fied state into which they got their own rosy faces in that once immaculate domain, well, as Miss Cornelia and Hannah never said one word about it, neither will I. The four women enjoyed the afternoon in their own way, and the schoolteacher buried himself in algebra to his own great satisfaction. When her guests went home in the starlit December dusk, Miss Cornelia walked part of the way with them and had a long, confidential talk with Mrs. Grant. When she returned, it was to find Hannah groaning in and over the kitchen and the schoolteacher dreamily trying to clean some molasses off his boots with the kitchen hairbrush. Long-suffering Miss Cornelia rescued her property and dispatched Mr. Palmer into the woodshed to find the shoebrush. Then she sat down and laughed. Hannah, what will become of that boy yet? There's no counting on what he'll do next. I don't know how he'll ever get through the world, I'm sure, but I'll look after him while he's here at least. I owe him a huge debt of gratitude for this Christmas blunder. What an awful mess this place is in. But Hannah, did you ever in the world see anything so delightful as that little Tommy Smithson stuffing himself with plum cake, not to mention Teddy Grant? It did me good just to see them. A Christmas Greeting There was a time when the spirit of Christmas was of the present. There is a period when most of it is of the past. There shall come a day, perhaps, when all of it will be of the future. The child time, the present. The middle years, the past. Old age, the future. Come to my mind Christmas days of long ago. As a boy, again I enter into the spirit of the Christmas stockings hanging before my fire. I know what the children think today. I recall what they feel. Passes childhood and I look down the nearer years. There rise before me remembrances of Christmas days on storm-tossed seas, where waves beat upon the ice-bound ship. I recall again the bitter touch of water-warping winter, of drifts of snow, of wind-swept plains. In the gamut of my remembrance, I am once more in the poor, mean, lonely little sanctuary out on the prairie, with a handful of Christians, mostly women, gathered together in the freezing, drafty building. In later years, I worship in the great cathedral church, ablaze with lights, verdant and fragrant with the evergreen pines, echoing with joyful carols and celestial harmonies. My recollections are of contrasts like those of life, joy and sadness, poverty and ease. And the pictures are full of faces, many of which may be seen no more by earthly vision. I miss the clasp of vanished hands. I crave the sound of voices stilled. As we old and older grow, there is a note of sadness in our glee. Whether we will or not, we must twine the cypress with the holly. The recollection of each passing year brings deeper regret. How many have gone from those circles that we recall when we were children? How many little feet that pattered upon the stair on Christmas morning now tread softer paths and walk in broader ways? 
sisters and brothers who used to come back from the far countries to the old home. Alas, they cannot come from the farther country in which they are now, and perhaps, saddest thought of all, we would not wish them to come again. How many with whom we joined hands around the Christmas tree have gone? Circles are broken, families are separated, loved ones are lost, but the old world sweeps on. Others come to take our places. As we stood at the knee of some unforgotten mother, so other children stand. As we listen to the story of the Christ child from the lips of some gray old father, so other children listen, and we ourselves, perchance, are the fathers or mothers, too. Other groups come to us for the deathless story. Little heads, which recalled vanished halcyon days of youth, bend around another, younger mother. Smaller hands than ours write letters to Santa Claus and hear the story, the sweetest story ever told, of the baby who came to Mary and threw her to all the daughters and sons of women on that winter night on the Bethlehem hills. And we thank God for the children who take us out of the past, out of ourselves, away from recollections that weigh us down. The children that weave in the woof and warp of life when our own youth has passed. Some of the buoyancy, the joy, the happiness of the present. The children in whose opening lives we turn hopefully to the future. We thank God at this Christmas season that it pleased him to send his beloved son to come see us as a little child, like any other child. We thank God that in the lesser sense we may see in every child who comes today another incarnation of divinity. We thank God for the portion of his spirit with which he dowers every child of man, just as we thank him for pouring it all upon the infant in the manger. There is no age that has not had its prophet, no country, no people, but that has produced its leader. But did any of them ever come before as a little child? Did any of them begin to lead while yet in arms? Lodges there upon any other baby brow, round the top of sovereignty? What distinguished Christ and his Christian followers from all the world? Behold, no mighty monarch, but a little child shall lead them. You may see through the glass darkly. You may not know or understand the blessedness of faith in him as he would have you know it. But there is nothing that can dim the light that radiates from the birth in the crude cave back of the inn. Ah, it pierces through the darkness of that shrouding night. It shines today. Still sparkles the star in the east. He is that star. There is nothing that can take from mankind even doubting mankind, the spirit of Christ in the Christmas season. Our celebrations do not rest upon the conclusions of logic or the demonstrations of philosophy. I would not even argue that they depend inevitably or absolutely upon the possession of a certain faith in Jesus. But we accept Christmas nevertheless. We endeavor to apply the Christmas spirit for just once in the year. It may be because we cannot, try as we may, crush out utterly and entirely the divinity that is in us that makes for God. The stories and tales for Christmas, which have for their theme the hard heart softened, are not mere fictions of the imagination. They rest upon an instinctive consciousness of a profound philosophic truth. What is the unpardonable sin, I wonder? Is it to be persistently and forever unkind? Does it mean perhaps the absolute refusal to accept the principle of love, which is indeed creation's final law? The lessons of the Christmas tide are so many. The appeals that now may be made to humanity crowd to the lips from full minds and fuller hearts. Might we not reduce them all to the explication of the underlying principle of God's purpose to us, as expressed in those themic words of love with which angels and men greeted the advent of the child on the first Christmas morning, goodwill towards men? Let us then show our goodwill toward men by doing good and bringing happiness to someone, if not everyone, at this Christmas season. Put aside the memories of disappointments, of sorrows that have not vanished, of cares that still burden, and do good in spite of them because you would not dim the brightness of the present for any human heart but the shadows of old regrets. Do good because of a future which opens possibilities before you, for others, if not for yourselves. Friends, all, let us make up our minds that we will be kindly affectioned one to another in our homes and out of them on this approaching Christmas day. That the old debate, the ancient strife, the rankling recollection, the sharp contention shall be put aside. That envy, hatred, and malice, and all uncharitableness shall be done away with. Let us forgive and forget. But if we cannot forget, let us at least forgive. And so let there be peace between man and man at Christmas, a truce of God. Let us pray that love shall come as a little child to our households. 
that he shall be in our hearts and shall find his expression in all that we do or say on his birthday of goodness and cheer for the world. Then let us resolve that the spirit of the day shall be carried out through our lives, that as Christ did not come for an hour, but for a lifetime and would fain become as little children on this day of days that we may begin a new life of goodwill to men. Let us make this a new birthday of kindness and love that shall endure. That is a Christmas hope, Christmas wish. Let us give it to the gracious expression of life among men.